Well, hello there and welcome to School of the Spirit. I'm so excited to be with you right here. And I thank God for what he's doing um, through the sessions that we've been having together. And I also want to uh, thank you so much for always tuning in, especially those of us who are already subscribed to this channel. It shows you value the word of God and uh, the transformation that God is bringing to us through this platform. So thank you once again for joining. Today is going to be a wonderful time. This episode is going to be um, revealing intricate, intricate details, uh, secrets uh, through which we can see great, mighty move of God in our time today. With that said, I'd like us to pray briefly and then we'll get right into the session for today. Father, thank you for my viewer and listener right now. You are the God of all grace. You will grant us the grace to understand, the grace to comprehend what you will say. Give me the utterance to communicate your heart to your people. And at the end of this session, let us experience genuine transformation by the power of your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much once again for being here. You know, we've been looking at uh, transformation by prayer. And it's been an amazing time, you know, just exploring from the Word of God the different stages of transformation that occurs uh, in the life of a believer that prays. There are benefits that comes with these transformations uh, because it takes us into superior versions of ourselves. It takes us to the experience of the glory of God in greater degrees and greater measures. And it's something that God has planned to be part of our Christian experience. And so the door is open for every believer to explore this wonderful uh, process of transformation that occurs through the art and the lifestyle of prayer. You know, John Wesley one of the great preachers of our faith uh, from the 16th century said this, made this powerful statement uh, when he was asked how God was able to use him to bring revival that spread all throughout England and Europe. He said simply, I set myself on fire and the world came to see me burn. John Wesley was a very passionate Methodist preacher that God used to bring and to ignite and to bring great revival in England and in the entire Europe. Um, the Methodist Church is one of the movements that was uh, produced by that mighty revival and it has lasted even to this day. That being said, we want to look at another episode as we continue on the series of transformation by prayer. This time around, we are looking at the territorial or terrestrial stage. The territorial or terrestrial stage. In other words, how God can bring revival to our community and use us to change the status quo. How through prayer we can shape cultures and we can transform generations upon generations. The change that can occur in society because of men who have given their lives to prayer. You know, in Second Corinthians Chronicles, I mean to say, chapter 7, verse 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. He says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. I will not only forgive their sins and hear them from heaven, but I will heal their land. God is more than ready to stretch forth his hand and to touch our world 
but he cannot do it without going through us. He wants to touch creation, society. He wants to change the landscape of things and he wants to do it through us. And this happens when we pray. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Will humble themselves to pray. If only we can embrace prayer as a lifestyle, we'll get to see God do unimaginable things that can change and shape culture, change the status quo, bring life into our dying and decaying and depleting world, which is something we need to see now more than ever. In Psalms 85, verse 6 to 7, I want to read a very wonderful scripture that may be familiar to some of us. Psalms 85, verses 6 to 7. It says, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. When you revive us again, then there is an outburst of joy. It flows from your people into society. And it's a question, will you not revive us again? More like a prayer. And I, 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 I sincerely hope and pray with all my heart that in every territory, God will have saints of ease who will call upon him day and night till they see his hand touch the culture, shape the culture of the day and change the environment and the world around them, recreating the world and restoring the peace and all that has been lost from the, this present world that we live in. You know the Bible says in Isaiah 60 verse 2 that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness of people and we're already living in that from the darkness of ignorance to the darkness of evil and corruption and injustice and all of these things that have plagued society eating deep into the fabric of society. God is looking for men and women that will become his move of healing, his move of change, his move of revival, to awaken the things that were once dead, to awaken the oracles of God that have been silent over territories, over nations, over generations, that God can be brought to the scene again. This is something that can only happen in the place of prayer now i said two things at the beginning of this series that i'm going to say again number one i said that prayer changes you first and that's true the first thing that changes when you pray is you not god we change when we pray from coming into the understanding of god's will to experiencing all the other kind of changes that we have talked about in this series. Prayer changes you first. Number two, I said that God wants to change the world around you by changing you. So when we are changed and transformed by prayer, God begins to change the world around us. He uses us. That means that a transformed life is the catalyst for a transformed nation. A transformed man is the catalyst for a transformed society. You can never see change for the better in any society, in any uh, territory, until you find men whose life have been shaped, remolded, changed, re-enhanced through the power that comes by the lifestyle of prayer. Hallelujah. I want to read three, three scriptures that I believe are models, scriptural models of how revival can come into a territory, how society can be affected when we pray. Because if nothing changes in our world, then there is no proof that we have been changed or transformed. The proof that we have truly met with God and we have experienced transformation. The proof that we carry the life of God in us is the change that it orchestrates around us. 
It's a change. Jesus said, let your life so shine. Let your light so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Remember, the Bible calls us the light of the world and the salt of the earth. The proof that we truly carry the life of God is the change that um, we see that happens around us. Society becomes the reflection of the transformation that we have experienced in prayer. Number one, let's start with Isaiah 32, verse 15 to 18. Very wonderful scripture that I've known for years now that has really um, etched me into the place of prayer and a cry to see uh, territorial revival. Isaiah 32, verse 15 to 17. Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. It says that when the Spirit is poured, the wilderness will become a fruitful field. And then the fruitful field will become a forest. You see different stages of transformation that will happen. First of all, because of the outpouring of the Spirit, the wilderness receives life to become fruitful. And then as the outpouring continues, the fruitful field now becomes a mighty forest where there are lots of trees and shrubs and herbs. So there is progressive change that can happen in society when we pray. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that brings true and genuine revival. The kind of prayer that reignites passion for God in the hearts of people like a flame. The kind of prayer that forces the hearts of men to be turned back to God. Even though the Bible says that in the last days men will be lovers of themselves. So the odds are already stuck against us. But it will take genuine prayer and intercession to cause the wilderness to be transformed, to become a forest. Now, I want to look in details uh, to verse 16 and 17. In verse 16, the Bible says, Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. Now, this is figurative, so that we can understand uh, the reason for the use of these terms it says justice will dwell in the wilderness because the wilderness there is figurative expression for society the decayed and depleting state of society that's why it's called wilderness it will in it will dwell justice and you know that is what we need for a society to be brought into balance. For law and order to be maintained in society, there has to be justice, there has to be equity, there has to be fairness in our systems. From the government to the military to the private sector to the public sector, there has to be justice and equity. Everybody must learn to do right, must embrace right standing so that corruption can become extinct the bible says justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness in the fruitful field the fruitful field now is symbolic of the church because society cannot be righteous why because righteousness is a character of god the bible says he made him who was without sin to be seen for us that we will become the righteousness of god righteousness is the character of god that can only exhume from a life that has become born again and transformed by the spirit so we cannot say righteousness for society no they can't they can't live right or they can't they can't uh, um, um, express the character of righteousness because they are of the world. They are not born again. They don't have the seed and the life of God in them. But we have the seed and the life of God in us. So the fruitful field, there's the church. 
that we begin to embrace the place of righteousness, not just imputed righteousness, which we have by default when we become born again, but applied righteousness when we begin to allow that which is a seed in us to find expression. Just like John said in 1 John chapter 3, I believe in verse 7, it says that we be not deceived, that he that draws right is right, does righteousness is right, is righteous. He that does righteousness is righteous. So when there is righteousness in the church and when there is justice in society, the Bible says in verse 17 that the work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Peace is restored in our homes. Peace is restored in our environment, in our surrounding, especially with the rate of insecurity that is growing every day in our world today. And remember that peace is one of the character of the kingdom. In Romans 14, 17, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not in meat and drinking, but in righteousness, in peace, and in joy in the Holy Ghost. So every time you find peace, then know that the kingdom of God has come within that domain, within that territory. So peace will be restored. And then in verse 18, it says, My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. The outpouring of the Spirit is what does all of these things. And it only can happen when we pray and cry genuinely. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse um, 14 or 16 thereabout, that the people that Jesus left when he ascended, they continued in prayer and in supplication. And in chapter 2 of Acts, verse 1, that they were in one accord in one place, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. So it is prayer and intercession. You remember Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem, Luke 24, 49, until they were endued with power from our eyes. So it is prayer and intercession that provokes the outpouring of the Spirit, which brings about righteousness in the church and justice in society. What a wonderful kind of transformation that will be the second scripture is lamentations chapter 2 verses 18 to 19 i just saw the scripture today and i i was so fascinated by um, what i saw he says their heart cried out to the lord O wall of the daughter of zion let tears run down like a river day and night Give yourself no relief. Give your eyes no rest. Now, this is a picture of what I call prolonged intercession. Weeping and crying and crying out to God. Prolonged intercession. Why? Why must they engage in intercession? Verse 19, it says, Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands toward him. For the life of your young children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. He's talking about a dysfunctional society, a broken down society where law and order is misplaced. People suffering from hunger, impoverishment, famine, natural disasters, name it. He says, cry before the face of the Lord and lift your hands towards him. I remember psalms 141 verse 2 says that the lifting of my hands like the evening sacrifice which is a form of prayer the bible says you do this for the sake of your young children children represents the future so this is a call to intercession so that destruction does not overtake the future of a particular generation that's what the prophet is saying in lamentations here prolonged intercessions now prolonged intercessions are um, extended or elongated seasons of prayer consistent prayer again and again and again a passion to see revival at all costs 
and because of that passion not backing down in the place of prayer and in church history there's a man called count zinzodorf um who was a very wealthy um wed- very wealthy person and who founded what was called the church of the moravians and they they had a covenant of 24 hour prayer so they prayed in groups for 24 hours every day and they did that consistently for 100 years and it was after that time that the methodist revival what you saw that god did through the lives of john and charles wesley george whitfield and some of these um, english missionaries that move was birthed by this 100 years of prayer prolonged intercession you want to see god move in your territory you are tired of the ills that has befallen your nation there are so many nations that are in, in dire need of the move of god the darkness of evil is swallowing up so many nations you, you get on mainstream media get on the news and you just see so much to make your heart sick so much to get depressed god is looking for men jesus taught a parable in luke chapter 18 verse 1 that men ought always to pray in in first timothy chapter 2 paul paul said i think in verse 6 or 7 there about he said i will that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands in verse uh, 2 i believe of that same chapter he says that we should pray for kings and those in position so that we lead quiet and peaceable life until a church arises until believers arise in prayer we will never see society restored we will just keep seeing it go from worse to worse the pain of 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 those who have their loved ones who were murdered now in my country nigeria kidnapping is it has become a business it, it's it's now the order of the day in almost every part of the nation if we want to see change then we must get to the place of prayer like lamentation we must cry to the lord we must stand on our watches uh, watches there simply means having specific times of prayer like the psalmist says in psalms 55 i believe in verse 17 he says for me i will call upon the lord and i will look up he says evening and morning and noon and habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 he said i will stand upon my watch and set me upon my tower there has to be men that will keep the watch of prayer praying in the night time praying at noonday praying at morning praying at evening we we need to make a routine of this kind of intercession and prayer if we want to see great revivals happen in our time if we want to see transformation in society if we want to see the economy of nations restored if we want to see a massive change in the ideology the mindset of the people in africa now we're experiencing what they call the brain drain a lot of you know uh, 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 specialized workers going overseas going to europe to america to australia because they are looking for greener pastures why can't we have an economy that is functional that can unnest these people i tell you the truth the government have done all that they can do we need to pray if we want to see change if we're tired of the crisis and the cries then we need to arise and pray this is a call this this is a call to arms a call to intercession the last scripture and then we are done for today is acts chapter 4 verse 31 to 35 this is now a practical um scenario of what a prayerful church can produce in acts chapter 4 verses 31 to 35 it says and when they had prayed The place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power 
the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them, upon them all. Nor was there any anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Now, this is a practical uh, scenario of revival that is produced by a praying church. They had warned them not to preach again in the name of Jesus. And they went back and they prayed. And the Bible says that they, they, they experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so much that they spoke the word this time around with boldness. With boldness. They were able to speak the word of God that brought salvation to their territory. The next thing we see in verse 32 was that prayer bonded the believers. One of the strongest bonding forces on earth is prayer. I tell you the truth. If you find a group of people who pray together consistently, there is a bonding that happens in their heart and in their minds. You become so glued to people that you pray with often. It's a bonding that is beyond the natural. This is not like the emotion uh, that young people experience when they're in love. No, this is something more powerful. It's like a covenant relationship. The Bible says that they were of one heart and of one soul. And because of that, they shared their things in common. So there was no lack. The third thing we saw was that the apostles witnessed the resurrection of Jesus with great power. They spoke. They bore witness. This time around, they didn't just preach. But they began to walk signs and wonders. Why? The Bible says great grace. The word great in the Greek is the word megatos. Great. It means exceeding. Mighty. Grace was upon them. All of this was procured by prayer. And I tell you the truth. You cannot argue with proofs. You cannot argue with the man that has results. When the Jewish community saw the signs and wonders that these guys wrought. They had to just accept and come to terms that the Jesus that they preached was truly resurrected and alive. The proof to our world today that the Jesus we serve is alive is when they are able to see him heal the sick, when they are able to see him raise the dead, when they are able to see him provide for people, when they are able to see his power as of old come alive again, coming alive through us. This is the proof that the Jesus we preach is alive and alive forevermore. Another thing we saw in verse 34 was a sacrificial lifestyle that was posed by the church. Those who had lands, sold the lands. They were so committed to the advancement of the kingdom that they would even deploy their financial and material resources. They sold their lands and properties and brought the money to the church so that first of all, the apostles were funded that's what I believe because, you know, the verse before that was talking about the apostles. That the apostles were funded and well catered for to preach the gospel and then to the general community of believers. Now, this, this, this is a, a perfect scenario of the kind of revival that comes when men pray. I have been privileged by God to see in a short time the revival that can span through a group of people. Uh, that I give into prayer. I remember when I was in the university, we would go to pray at a particular place every night. And we kept doing that from one person to two people, to four people, to six people, to seven people. And we were like that for about three years. And when it was final year, all of a sudden, there was a move of God that broke out. I remember those days would come for meet prayer meetings at midnight you'll find 30 people, 40 people or more praying. And those were the days where we saw deliverances, we saw healings. I mean, I saw, I saw God move so much that I, was, I became scared. Sometimes walking on the streets of campus, I remember a particular day, I was walking with my friend, and then some sisters who knew us came to greet us. And when I shook the hands of one of them, she was almost going down under the power of the Spirit of God. So much to a point where we had to follow a secret route 
to the place of prayer because we are afraid of what will happen when we met with people. I mean, I saw, I saw miracles. I, I, saw, I saw weight loss. I saw limbs grow out. We, we saw mighty things that God did. So miraculous that even when we left, that culture and that spirit remained for some years. And I've been able to witness through that instance the power of revival that prayer can produce. It, it just changes the status quo. It brings a new order. And that's what God wants us to bring in our world today, a new world order, a, a, a system where everybody embraces righteousness, everybody embraces justice, everybody embraces fairness, where the consciousness of God is brought back, especially in places like Europe now, where, where there, is, there is a decline of Christianity in some of the Western nations, that, that, that God can be brought to the scene again is when people pray. And I want to say this to somebody. I feel led to say this by the Spirit before we shut down today. Don't think that you'll have to wait for God to send a mighty evangelist or a great apostle to come to your city and then they will now be the ones to champion the move of God. No. God has always been known to use weak vessels. God will always use, he will always take from that place, raise a man from that place. Because the Bible says he's no respecter of persons. That in every nation, anyone who fears him and calls on his name will be saved. Don't wait for one great preacher to come. You start praying. You start calling upon God. You start a routine that forces you to the place of prayer every day. And watch what happens. You may do it for some time, for some days, some weeks, some months, and you're just alone. But very soon, the embers of the fire of your prayer will begin to spread. People will begin to join you, just like we saw on campus. People will begin to join you, and then it will spread like wildfire. It's you that God wants to use. Not someone else from another territory. It's you. The people are searching for the move of God then they are looking for men who are ready to pray. And I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, let the passion and the hunger for prayer ignite, engulf, and envelop our hearts. Use us to bring territorial change, territorial revival and transformation. Just like the apostles, they spoke about them in Acts 17, that these men who have turned the world upside down. Use us to turn our world upside down and even right side up. Use us to bring the change that is consistent with your will. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Let us see the move of your spirit like in the days of Elijah. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want to give you an assignment. Schedule a routine of prayer. And if you can, get one or two persons to pray with you. Even if it's just a particular time every day. Do that for 30 days. Do that for 40 days. Watch what happens. You will experience all the stages of transformation, including territorial revival, territorial change. See how God can affect your world through you and change the patterns that held sway. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.